working again. Why don't you just let it go? Okay. Sorry for the inconvenience. We're going to start again. Beginning of the lecture. Rucham Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming and welcome to our home. The, um, <laughs> the topic that we're going to talk about tonight is worry. Now, recently I heard this statement and I found it very enlightening. Worry is a conversation that you have with yourself about things you can't change. Prayer is a conversation you have with God about things he can change. Worry, it's, it, when it comes to worry, it seems that there are times when that's all we do. We can't shake the feeling, especially today with the pandemic, social unrest. It's like the whole world is in chaos. It seems like everyone is worried. In reality, there seems to be a lot to worry about. Health, wealth, politics, religion, children, marriage. I mean, the list goes on and on. So what are we supposed to do? Put our heads in the sand and pretend the world isn't going crazy? You know, there are many different reasons for us to worry. One of them is because we in some way actually think that we are in charge. But the reverse is really true. <clears throat> if we were in charge, then we wouldn't have anything to worry about. We could just take action and take care of the problem. So we worry because we're not in charge. But what does worrying accomplish? What are we supposed to do? If we worry, we're OCD. If we don't worry, then we're naive and irresponsible. So what's the answer? So basically, it's God's world, not ours. We are only soldiers. We do not make the major decisions in the world. God does. It's his world. So the question becomes, why take on more responsibility than we have to? All of our knowledge is flawed. So therefore, in reality, our decisions will also be flawed. <laughs> Great. So how are we to navigate our lives through this circus we call life? You know, God is our Father. He loves us and wants us to succeed. And so to help us in our journey through this minefield we call life, he gave us a book of instruction. It's called the Bible. An acronym for a book of instruction by which to live on earth. In Hebrew, we call it the Torah. In it, we find stories and snapshots of time, examples of life situations that our ancestors were tested with. Some they handled well, and others they failed bitterly. But in either case, whether they succeeded or failed, we have learned the lesson in life. <clears throat> we have been instructed. Now, one of the greatest examples in the Torah of someone who was beset by worry was Yaakov, our father, Jacob. After 20 years, he left his father-in-law's Laban's house, and he's traveling with his family and possessions on his way back to see his elderly father. He is told that his brother Asa was coming to meet him with an army of 400 armed men. The verse in the book of Bereshit in the portion of Ayishlach 32.8 states that when Yaakov heard the news about his brother, it says, Vayera Yaakov ma'od v'yetzer lo. Yaakov was very frightened and distressed. Again, a double term. But why? Yaakov was this righteous individual, and his brother Esau was evil. Surely he had nothing to worry about. God would most certainly protect him. Now, we know that we're certain that Yaakov believed in God, <clears throat> so the problem wasn't God. It was really a belief that he had in himself, or lack of belief. He was afraid that Esau, his brother, possessed two great merits. First, the merit of honoring his elderly father, and then the merit of living in the land of Israel. <clears throat> he was concerned. He knew that it was only because of God's protection that he was able to retain his spiritual stature and prosper financially at the same time. He felt that he may well have diminished his rewards. It could be possible that he no longer possessed enough merit to protect himself and his family from the evil designs of his brother. But God had promised him when he left his father's house in the portion of Ayetze, 2815, and God said to him that I am with you, 
I will protect you wherever you go and bring you back to this soil. I will not turn aside from you until I have fully kept this promise to you. Quote. So what was he worrying about? God promised. Like all of us, he was able to think of many scenarios that would not obligate God to help him. Maybe he had used up all of his merits, or maybe the promise of protection was only for him and not his family. Maybe he would be saved, but he would be seriously injured in battle, crippled, but still alive. There are no limits to what our imagination can stir up when given free reign. What if? On the night before he meets Asa, he is expecting an account. He, he has an unexpected encounter and then battle with Asa's angel. He was victorious. He was able to battle with an angel of God and win. If you think about it, it's very interesting. He was overly worried about his, this, his possible battle with his brother, a physical being. And yet, he was able to battle with an angel of God, a far superior spiritual being, and be victorious. But why? So with Asa, he had previous knowledge that he was on his way, and Yaakov felt that he would be an eminent threat. He didn't know what was in his brother's mind. After all, they had seen or spoken to each other for 34 years. Their last, their last encounter was less than cordial. Yaakov had a run for his life. Asa was contemplating killing his younger brother. The Cheskuni states that a doubt in one's heart is the worst possible situation in which to find oneself in. So the verse in Vayishlach 32.8 that Yaakov was very afraid and that caused him a great deal of distress. Distress is an even greater emotion than fear. His fear caused his distress. And once we allow our emotions to overpower our logic, we weaken our defenses and we panic. This is not a recipe for success. Yaakov split his entourage into two camps, thinking that if Asaph destroys the first camp, the second camp could flee. Now in battle, <clears throat> numbers make a difference. I don't think that splitting your forces would constitute a viable strategy. He seemed to have lost his self-confidence instead of believing in himself and his relationship with God Almighty. He panics. That night he crosses the river of Yabuk to retrieve some small vessels that he had left behind. Again, he doesn't seem focused. His thoughts are on the up upcoming encounter with his brother Asa. He should not have he should have had someone else with him accompany him across the, the river. <clears throat> but no, he was alone. That was when he was attacked by Asa's angel. It was dark. And it wasn't until the early morning that he realized that his opponent was not a man, but an angel. But he prevailed. He overcame an angel, God. He didn't have time to overthink the situation. He just reacted, and with that, he was victorious. We need to believe, we need to know that it is God who runs the world. He is the ultimate programmer. Any challenge that we encounter in life was programmed by God, our Father in heaven not an accident. Whether we understand the reason or not, we can be sure of one thing, that as hard as it is to understand at times that Gamzu Lutov, that everything that happens to us in our lives is for our benefit. We are never given a challenge that we cannot overcome, as the saying goes. Anything that doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Now, with that knowledge in hand, we should never worry. <laughs> well, that would be nice, but that's not how it happens. Worry is an emotion, and emotions are very difficult to control. That, then, is one of the greatest challenges in life, to believe in God, but also to believe in ourselves. The first question that we need to ask ourselves is, is what I'm worrying about, is it worth the bother? You know, you can't worry about everything, but some of us do try. We need to train ourselves just to let things go. We need to be problem solvers. 
we need to see potential problems as a challenge, not a difficulty. You know, I'm an avid black diamond skier. But I didn't start skiing until I was 35 years old. I had a friend who <clears throat> loved skiing and constantly tried to get me to go with him, try the sport. <clears throat> and I would just laugh and tell him, when I stand on a stepladder, I get dizzy. How am I supposed to go up on a mountain that's 8,000, 12,000 feet high? But he didn't give up. So one day, just to shut him up, I finally took him up on his offer, and we went skiing. The rest is history. But I learned a couple important lessons in life when I took up skiing. First of all, when I ski, I only look three feet in front of me. So no matter how steep the terrain, it always seems relatively flat to me. Secondly, I never st stop at the top of a run and look down at the topography. When I come to the top, I just ski right over it and start going down the, the mountain. If I stop to look, I may well change my mind, indecision. So too in life, I try to never get ahead of myself. If you look too far into the distance, many times you trip on that which is right in front of you. Unless it is a necessity, I only deal with that which I need now. I try to stay and live in the moment. The truth is that each moment of our lives is a gift and deserves our undivided attention. We can't bring it back. When we stay in the moment, many times the problems that would have occurred in the future are resolved by themselves. It's amazing at how many times we create our own problems. When it comes to not standing at the top of the run and looking down the mountain, I find that many times in our lives we perceive a problem to be a mountain. But when we reach the other side and look back, we may smile because it was only a hill. It is so true that when you are looking at a problem, our worries and concerns make any small difficulty into a complete disaster. We may be worried and insecure before we begin a project, but once we dive in, more often than not, our worries are ended and feeling of success will prevail. Sure. You should prepare for all events in your life. Prepare that does not include worrying. Worrying will never make you better at anything that you do. It will not help you problem solve. Worrying creates pressure, and pressure is not the recipe for great decision making. Think the problem through. If you can talk to people who know you know and trust, do so. Read up. Whatever works. Do your homework. You don't have to worry if you make smart and informative decisions. Another factor that causes us to worry is procrastination. Pushing off problems that need to be addressed now. That only causes us grief and apprehension. Worrying solves nothing. It only causes ulcers. It destroys us physically and mentally. Just too much pressure. And the longer we push it off, the worse it gets. Anything that you don't want to do should be the first thing that you actually do. Deal with it. Worrying is most often far worse than the reality. And maybe the most important fact, what if you fail? I can assure you that if you use the failure properly, you will benefit immensely, as I've mentioned before. You learn nothing from success, but you learn a whole lot from failure. Remember what I started with. Worry is a conversation you have with yourself about things you cannot change. And prayer is a conversation you have with God about things that he can change. It's God's world. And you are at best a manager. If he is the owner. Let him, de let him get the ulcer. The buck doesn't stop at you. It stops at him. Instead of worrying, turn to him in prayer. You know, prayer is an acronym the words, please respond after you examine request. And with our prayers, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Sukkane quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. God bless and be well. Be safe.